Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dan Trotter, Pretty Good Bible Studies. This video is the sixth video in a series of videos concerning dispensationalism. I have already covered in the previous five uh, videos the introduction and introduction in history of dispensationalism, and I've talked about the three more. I uh, introduced the three main points of dispensationalism, which is dispensationalism's literal hermeneutic. The gaps of dispensationalism and the eternal segregation of Israel and the church. I am right here in point number three. Uh, and uh, under point number three, I've got some subpoints under the gaps of dispensationalism. Uh, I gave an introduction to the gap, the so called gap uh, theory of the dispensationalists. It says that there's a parenthesis between the old end of the old covenant and the beginning of the future jewish millennium which they posit exist which i don't believe exist and in between those two things is the church the glorious church of ephesians 5 which the dispensationalists relegate to the status of a gap of a parenthesis parenthesis of a vacuum I talked about in recent videos about how the dispensation is wrong to divide the word of truth, dividing the New Testament scriptures up into law, grace, and millennium, or Old Testament, New Testament, and future millennium, when it's all, all the prophecies and laws are actually talking about the church, not the future millennium. Then we talked about this postponement theory of the dispensationalists, how they postponed the kingdom, and so the church is not the kingdom. The true kingdom is the future millennium, which has been postponed from the time of Jesus. Last of all, I'm going to talk about the biggest gap of all is the famous gap between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel. This is a hard, hard piece of scripture. I have already dealt with the, the 70 weeks in a previous playlist I did on Orthodox Preterism. I've taken a preterist view of this, which is basically a traditional view on this particular scripture. Uh, if you're not an Orthodox Preterist, this should not bother you too much. Uh, I do have to apologize for the quality of the video. I was just learning how to do it, and I don't look at the camera too good. And there's a little bit of lag between my mouth and the words that come out of my mouth. But I've got that fixed now, but not on this particular uh, video. But at any rate, I hope you watch it. I hope you enjoy it. All right, we're going to start here in the book of Daniel, the 70 weeks, which is Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Before we start, uh, I want to give you some scholarly opinion as well as some rabbinic opinion of this passage and how difficult it is. J.A. Montgomery says, calls the 70 weeks the dismal swamp of Old Testament criticism. E.J. Young says, this passage is one of the most difficult in all the Old Testament, and the interpretations which have been offered are almost legion. And this is one of my favorite uh, observations on the 70 weeks. This is from a, a Jewish rabbi who says this, May the bones of the hands and the bones of the fingers decay and decompose of him who turns the pages of the book of Daniel to find out the time of Daniel 9, 24 through 27. And may his memory rot from off the face of the earth forever. Well, I hope my memory doesn't rot because I'm going to try to present to you an interpretation of 70 weeks, which I think is quite reasonable and also non-dispensationalist. Although I do admit that this issue is very, very difficult. Now, this prophecy is a key for dispensationalism. O.T. Alice, the famous anti-dispensational writer of the 1940s or so, I think it was, he says that this passage here is one of the clearest proofs of the novelty of that doctrine of dispensationalism as well of its revolutionary nature. In other words, the way the dispensationalists interpret Daniel 9, 24 through 27, the 70 weeks, is revolutionary. It's very non-traditional. Uh, and it shows that dispensationalism is a very new doctrine. It showed up in the 19th century. Nobody's ever heard of it before that. Meredith Klein, the famous reform scholar who talks about uh, covenants all the time, treaties, uh, ancient Near East treaties, he called dispensationalism an evangelical heresy. I think that's a little strong. I like to use the term heresy for people who are actually, actually outside the faith. Uh, 
and go into the bad place. Uh, and, of course, dispensationalists are good Christian brethren. But uh, I definitely think it's an error. And I think that this passage right here uh, contributes to that error greatly. So, as, as we'll see when we get in here, I'm going to try to steer clear of the dispensationalist interpretation of the 70 weeks. Now, John Walvoord, who is himself a dispensationalist, a prominent dispensationalist, he says that the 70 weeks is the quote-unquote key to prophecy and consequently, quote, what are the most important prophecies of the Bible. So what we're looking at here is not only very difficult, it's very important and it's very key to modern evangelical systems of interpreting prophecy. So we need to take a look at it. So let's start. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring to everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, this passage here is used by preterists and other traditional interpreters of, of this passage uh, to be fulfilled at the first advent of Jesus. This prophecy points to the first advent according to the preterist interpretation. The futurist uh, have it fulfilled at the second advent of Jesus. And when I say futurist, I mainly mean dispensationalist in this context. Now, let, we're going to have to break this verse down. We'll start with 77s. Now, this is almost universally interpreted by conservative interpreters, whether traditionalist, preterist, or dispensationalist. This is almost interpreted as universally interpreted as 490 years. 490 days doesn't mean anything. The word day or the word year is not in there. The, the original, I think, is translated as heptads, a, 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 a group of seven. It doesn't say seven days or seven years, but we're going to take it as 70, as, as, uh, 70 years because that's, um, there's hardly any disagreement on that. Uh, 77s of years, uh, I should say, 70 weeks of years, which comes out to 490 years. Now, this first phrase, uh, these 77s or 490 years are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression. Now, when did this occur? I'm going to talk about the starting date of this 490 years later. That's where a lot of controversy is. Uh, right now, let's just uh, look at this verse here and look at, at what's going to happen at the end. First of all, um, your people and your holy city will, city will finish transgression. In other words, the Jews in Jerusalem are going to finish transgression. That means they're going to put Jesus on the cross, and he's going to die, and that's going to be the end of sin. That's what that means. Finish transgression means the end of sin. That happened when Jesus was on the cross. And Daniel goes on to elaborate on finished transgression. He says to put an end to sin. That's what Jesus did by dying on the, dying on the cross. He put an end to sin as we see here in red. And, and the green phrase coming up next, after the 490 years, um, the holy, the, the, the Daniel's people in the holy city will atone for wickedness. Well, what happened? How did Jesus, what happened then? How was wickedness atoned for? Jesus died for sin on the cross and atoned for sin on the cross. So we see here that the ending of this 490 period refers to the time of Jesus' death. It says also of the 77s of decree to bring an everlasting righteousness in the blue there. Well, who brought in everlasting righteousness? That, of course, was Jesus. When he died on the cross, he started the church. He forgave sin, and that brought in, brought in everlasting righteousness for believers whose righteousness will never wear out. Continuing with verse 24 in Daniel 9, we see that the 77s are to seal up vision and prophecy. Well, how are vision and prophecy sealed up? Well, Old Testament prophecy quit with Jesus. He was the last prophet. And so when Jesus died, that was the end of Old Testament prophecy. And it was said by Daniel to be sealed up. No more vision, no more prophecy. There have been no, prof there have been no prophets since Jesus and last of all, the 77s are, are decreed to anoint the most holy. Now, it doesn't say the most holy city. It doesn't say the most holy person. It doesn't say the most holy place. And commentators love to argue over what that is. I, I'll take it in the most simple uh, meaning of it. It's talking because it fits the context of the previous 
events, which obviously refer to the death of Jesus on the cross, uh, and at the time of Jesus' first advent, so to anoint the most holy, I take it to mean that Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit at his baptism, which happened uh, at roughly the same time as the, uh, the other events happened. We'll get into more precise details as far as the timing of this as we go on. Now, starting in the next verse, the first part of verse 25 in chapter 9, Daniel says this, or actually it's Gabriel talking to Daniel, says this, No one understand this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. There will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. Now here's where all the fun begins. When is the decree that begins the 490 years, the 70 weeks? There are four options. Uh, most conservative commentators ignore Cyrus's decree of 538 and Darius's decree of 520 because the if you add 490 years to that, you end up in the first century BC, which is meaningless. So that's nice. We can knock those out. But there is dispute over the next two possibilities, which are uh, Artaxerxes' first decree in 458 BC, and some people say 457, but I'm going to say 458 because that's what most people say. Uh, and then there's also Artaxerxes' second degree, which is 444 B.C. Now, I'm going to take 458 B.C., and I'm going to explain to you why I think it fits so nicely. I will mention a problem with it, and I will, after I finish, go, I will briefly talk about why 444 B.C. is not, is, is I think, a, a reasonable, a, a reasonable assumption except that there's a problem with it that I think is bigger than the problem of 458 B.C. So, let's take the phrase that's in gold there. When the anointed one, after the 490 years happen, we'll have the anointed one, the ruler, he will come. And then this last phrase here, it says, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. Now, that adds up to 69 weeks of years, not 70 weeks of years. So we've got to deal with the 69-year period first before we get to the 70th week. And the 69th period can be divided into two periods here, seven sevens of years and 62 sevens of years. So we've got three sevens to look at, Se the period of seven sevens, a period of 62 sevens, and the period of the 70th seven. So, to make this simple, I'm going to start out with the 69 sevens. And we're going to look at a starting point of Artaxerxes' decree, 458 B.C., and we're going to take 69 sevens, which is 69 times 7, 483 years, if you start with 487 B.C., excuse me, 458 B.C., uh, and take 483 years, which is 69 sevens. 483 minus 458 gives you 25 A.D. Now, but you have to add one year because there is no zero A.D., and that puts you up at 26 A.D. So let's take this as a working assumption, a working hypothesis. From the issuing of Artaxerxes' decree in 458 B.C., uh, 483 years, or 69 sevens, Pass by, and that takes us up to 26 A.D. Well, what happened in 26 A.D.? Daniel here says that the anointed one will come, the anointed one, the ruler. Well, I'm going to take that as referring to Jesus, the anointed one. Uh, and we're going to see in the next slide after this one that that refers to Jesus' baptism, which where he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. So that works pretty good. But now, before we go there, there's a problem. This decree of Artaxerxes was in 458 B.C., and it was to rebuild the temple. It's mentioned in Ezra 7, starting in verse 11, I think. Um, uh, Ezra verse 7, 23 says this, Whatever the God of heaven has prescribed, this is quoting Artaxerxes' decree. Uh, Artaxerxes says this, Whatever the God of heaven has prescribed, let it be done with diligence for the temple. And the critics of this, uh, this choice here, most of whom are dispensationalists, say, for example, John MacArthur says it can't refer to the temple. It cannot refer to the temple. Uh, 
Because, excuse me, uh, the 70 weeks beginning point cannot be Artaxerxes' decree of 458 because that decree refers to rebuilding the temple. Whereas Daniel in Daniel 9.25 says that the decree was to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Jerusalem right here, not the temple. So Daniel says the decree will be to rebuild Jerusalem, but Artaxerxes in 458 B.C. in the book of Ezra says that the decree was for rebuilding the temple. Well, that is a, small, a difficulty, and people like John MacArthur say it's an insuperable difficulty. I don't think so. I think it's a small difficulty because uh, building the temple would mean would have to mean rebuilding the city. You cannot... Uh, have the temple built there without the city being built up around it because the temple wouldn't be able to survive by itself. And not only that, uh, I don't have it on the PowerPoints here, but Ezra goes on in the, in the decree and says that Artaxerxes goes on in the decree, and Ezra records it, and Artaxerxes said, Ezra, I want you to appoint governors all over the place. Well, you're not going to have governors unless the city's rebuilt. So I think this is quibbling with Daniel over this. I think there's a reason that the quibbling is done is because dispensationalists, for reasons which we'll see later, prefer the Artaxerxes 4440 B.C. because it fits their scheme better, which we'll talk about in a little while. But I'm going to take it here to mean that, the, uh, that rebuilding the temple means rebuilding the city, and 458 B.C. is the proper, is the proper um, decree. Now, let's move on. Uh, with the exposition of verse 25, I told you that the 69 weeks is divided into seven sevens and 62 sevens. Well, let's look at this phrase, seven sevens. And I've looked at a lot of commentaries trying to, to figure out what happens after 49 years. Seven times seven is 49 years. Well, if you take Artaxerxes' decree, 458 minus 49, you end up in 49 B.C., which is nothing. There's no history that tells us that anything happened in 409. But on the other hand, if you take uh, 444 and minus uh, 49 years from that, you end up still with, an, with a, a, meaningless, a meaningless number. So most of the commentaries, regardless of which decree they use, say that the 77s is talking about the times of the rebuilding of Jerusalem under Nehemiah uh, and under Artaxerxes, uh, and that uh, you recall if you read the book of Nehemiah, the, the surrounding pagan rulers there gave the Israelites a lot of trouble. Sambalat, Tobiah, Gershom, the Arabian, they all oppose the Israelites, you can read that in Nehemiah chapters 4 and 6. So, uh, from the issue of the decree, 458, after f approximately 49 years, that was the time it took roughly to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Rebuilt with streets and a trench. The King James has plaza and moat. I think those words are difficult to, to uh to translate, but the point is that Jerusalem gets rebuilt. So that's what happens after the first 49 years, after all the trouble with the surrounding nations, uh, Jerusalem is rebuilt. And then we have the 62 sevens that come after that. Now, the seven sevens say that Jerusalem will, will be rebuilt, but in times of trouble. That green phrase, the phrase there in, uh, in uh, green here, the times of trouble, that's referring to all the trouble the Israelites had in rebuilding the city. All right, so that's the seven sevens. Now we need to look at the seven sevens and the 62 sevens. Actually, we've already looked at it. I'm going to give you a summary here because I know this is complicated. The decree, the issue of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, I'm going to take to being Artaxerxes' decree at 458 B.C. Uh, the seven sevens, I'm going to, take that to being re Jerusalem rebuilt starting under Nehemiah uh, which was rebuilt by the end of that that period I'm not I'm even tempted to think that seven sevens is somewhat symbolic because seven of course is a big biblical number a big symbolic number in the Bible and that his point is is that there will be completion of God's holy city it will be rebuilt and I don't think 409 BC has any a lot of significance now, the 62 sevens, uh, after that, the anointed one comes, the ruler. That's the Messiah. The anointed one comes, 
uh, he's anointed at his baptism in 226 A.D. Because if you take 69 weeks times 7, get 483 minus 458 from that, add 1 because there's no 80, 0, you come up with 26 A.D. when Jesus was baptized. Now, going on to verse 26, Daniel says this. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and have nothing. Now, cut off means crucified. So that now we're looking at Jesus' crucifixion date. Well, we've already got the 69 weeks ending up at AD 26, which was not when he was crucified. It's when he was baptized. So what we have to say here is this after is not immediately after the 62 sevens. Immediately after the 62 sevens, which come after the seven sevens for a total of 69 sevens. So basically what Daniel is saying here is after the 69 sevens, after the 69 sevens, you end up immediately with the baptism. But the after is not immediately. It means after after a period of time. The text never says immediately after, it's just after. So he was baptized at 26. After that, he was cut off in AD 30. So three and a half years after 26 AD, you end up in 30, which is the widely accepted date of the crucifixion. That's another reason this particular date, uh, a decree of 458 works so well, is that most people say 30 A.D. is the crucifixion date. There's a minority who say 33 A.D. is the crucifixion date, but most say 30 A.D. is. So I think that fits pretty good. Now let's go to Daniel, or still talking about Daniel, uh, verse 26. Go to the last part of the verse. After the anointed one is cut off, it says the people, the ruler who will come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now this is confusing because the first, the last time we encountered the word ruler, it was the anointed one who was the ruler, uh, and that was Jesus. But now this r ruler is now Titus. He destroyed the city and the sanctuary in the green there. He destroyed the city and the sanctuary in A.D. 70, the famous destruction of Jerusalem. So that can be confusing. So you have to make a distinction there between the anointed one, the ruler who who arrive, who arrives at the end of the 69 weeks. That's Jesus. But now we're jumping ahead here between AD 30 to AD 70. Uh, the ruler will come and destroy the city and Jerusalem. And again, the after is not immediately after. It's after. Afterwards, we have the crucifixion. And afterwards, we have the destruction of Jerusalem in 87. And a lot of people say, well, you know, there's a problem. I don't see a problem at all. It's literally true. Everybody likes to talk about literally interpreting things. Literally after the 62 sevens, literally after AD 26, we have the crucifixion of Jesus and the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Now, going on to the second uh, part of verse 26. I'm going to use the NIV here. Daniel says this, the end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. What's the end? This is still referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in 80, 80, 70, which we just mentioned in the first part of the verse. The end will come like a flood when the ruler will come and, and, and destroy it. Wars will continue until the end, the end of apostate Israel. Is the end that Daniel's talking about here. The end does not necessarily mean the end of the world, like futurists love to As soon as they see the word end, there's just something that drives a futurist to say the end of the world. No, it does not mean that. The end of Jerusalem will come like a flood. War will continue to the end. The Jewish war will uh, be prosecuted for between 66 and 70 A.D. until the end of the war, and desolations have been decreed. That phrase, that word desolations, really ties into the destruction of Jerusalem because Jesus predicted desolations in the Olivet Discourse. In Luke 21, 20, he says this, When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you know that its desolation is near. And that's why most preterists think, or all preterists think, that the abomination of desolation in the Olivet Discourse is referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 when the Roman armies came. All right, moving to verse 27, first part of the verse, again in the NIV. 
He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Now we're going with the he now refers to Jesus, not to Titus. Now we drop him back to Jesus. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven or for one week of years. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. All right, this is the 70th seven, the famous 70th week. This is where the dispensationalists and traditional preterists and other uh, uh, interpreters part company. Because the dispensationalists say that this seven, the 70th seven has somehow disassociated itself with the first 69 weeks and floated way off into the future. And now we're talking about the Antichrist. He's going to confirm some kind of covenant. And you'll hear, you can read reams of speculation on what that is. I don't want to even go there, even think about going there. The he refers to Jesus confirming a covenant. That's the new covenant with his church. Now, he will confirm a covenant with many, many Christians, for one seven. Now, it says in the middle of that seventh, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. So the covenant is confirmed for the whole seven, but Jesus is killed. He's cut off in the middle of the seven. Well, in the half of seven is three and a half. You take the end of the 69 weeks, which was 26, the time of his baptism, add three and a half, you end up at AD 30, which is, of course, the traditional date of the crucifixion of Jesus. So Jesus is crucified in the middle of the 70th week. It fits perfectly. Now, before Jesus is cut off in AD 30, in the first half of the 70th week, in the first three and a half years, the three and a half years of his ministry, uh, he, or roughly three and a half years of his ministry, that was when he made the covenant with Jews, with Jewish Christians who came into the kingdom. Then, of course, after he was killed, uh, the, the, after a while, the disciples went out and they started preaching to the Gentiles, and so he made a covenant with many Gentiles in the last half. Now, he's doing this through his Holy Spirit because he's in heaven. But the, the, the new covenant is still being confirmed, Jews and Gentiles, during that 70th week. Now, again, a lot of dispensations will say, well, what about the last three and a half years? You got it floating, floating around with, with Jesus not even there. Well, I don't know. Would you rather have three and a half years float or 2,000 plus years float like, like the uh, dispensationalists do when they chop off the 70th week? and put it off into the indeterminate, far-off future. All right, still with that, on that portion of the verse there, He, Jesus, will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, He will put an end to sacrifice and offering. Well, what does that mean? He was cut off in the middle of the seven, and in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. Well, he, was actu he actually put an end to sacrifice and offering by being cut off, because by the time he was killed, at the time he was killed, there was no more need for Old Testament sacrifices, because he was the ultimate sacrifice, the sacrifice that finished all other sacrifices. All right, let's go to the last part of Daniel 9, 27. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. And now the NIV in the margin has desolated city, and I think that makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to use the NIV margin. On the wing of abominations, that's the Roman idolatrous standards that were brought into Jerusalem during the Jewish war, the ones that had eagles on them. Uh, and, of course, abomination is always closely associated with idolatry, and abomination is an, is a, is an idol. So on the wing of abominations, another way of saying that is, the abominations flew in to Israel during the Jewish war. Shall come one who makes desolate. That's the desolator. That's Titus, the famous Roman general who later became emperor, who destroyed Jerusalem and burned it down. He will come and he will make the city desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolated city. The decreed end, of course, is the end of the 70th weeks. It was decreed where? In the Olivet Discourse, for example. Now, the desolated city, that ties uh, this event of the destruction of 8070. This ties Daniel back to the Olivet Discourse because Luke, in chapter 21, 21 verse 20, in Jesus' um, 
speaking of the Olivet Discourse, Luke says this, Jesus says this, When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you know that its desolation is near. So the desolated city is described both in Daniel and in the Olivet Discourse. I don't think there's any question that this refers to the 70th week. Now, I have finished my brief explanation of how I take Daniel 9, 24 through 27. I told you I would give you an alternative uh, decree, which is AD 44. I don't have PowerPoints for this, so I'll just talk about it. If you take AD 44, excuse me, not AD 44, Artaxerxes' decree of 444 B.C., if you take that decree as your starting point and you switch from solar years to lunar years, you end up at AD 33. And so you have the anointed one, the ruler, coming in AD 33. And with some real complicated manipulations of dates, theologians such as uh, Honer, H-O-E-H-N-E-R, I, th I think I'm pronouncing it right, Robert Anderson, a lot of people that dispensationalists rely on, they can actually pick the date where Jesus enters the city. And they say when the anointed ruler comes, uh, that's not referring to when he came to baptism. That re was, refers to when he came as the ruler of Jerusalem. Now, the problem I see with that, although the numbers sound very impressive, the problem I see with that is that they then take the 70th week, throw it off into the future. So when it says he is cut off in the middle of the 70th week, they don't have to worry about the dates anymore. Because the way they have it, if they took the, the uh, ruler, if they took the Messiah, the ruler being cut off in the middle of the 70th week, uh, it won't work because they have him being cut off at the end of the 69th week in 33 AD. So they take 69 weeks, start with 444, 69 weeks, ends up at 33 and then they forget about Jesus being cut off in the middle of the 70th week. And they, the way they do that is they toss the 70th week way off into the future. Now, I ask you, a gap between the 69th and the 70th week, which is over 2,000 years old and counting, that gap is bigger than the 490 years by a good bit, by at least a factor of four, and still counting. Does that make sense? I don't think so. And that's why... I don't believe in dispensationalism. I hope you don't either.